um, refugee camps. Um, I'll, I'll share one story uh, and then have um, Brooke come up. Um, when we were, uh, we haven't met until today, uh, Hamsa and Moshe and I, um, but when I was in Wisconsin, um, at the time that we were in ministry in Wisconsin, one of the biggest crises in the world was the uh, Sudanese uh, refugee crisis. There was a big uh, destabilization there. And we were in our congregation trying to figure out what to do. And you probably have seen more of these tents in, up close and in person than I have, but we actually bought one of the actual um, tents that they set up in the refugee camps and we set it up in our sacristy and then people uh, painted and decorated it and then we at th 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 that time the Sudanese camps were were um, uh, taking these tents that were being shipped from all over the world and so then we actually got to see a photo later of one camp where a lot of the tents are just the white standard canvas and then there were the ones that were painted and I think just having the direct connection is just very, very important. So um, I'm thankful for your work, and I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation, and welcome to Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. Be, uh, before Brooke comes up, I'd like to make just an announcement. I think Carol mentioned it last week that tomorrow night at Butterfield Trail, uh, Dr. Grace Donahue is speaking about the Marshallese. Uh, there is a large group of them here. I guess I really never knew that much about them, but it's going to be in the convocation room at 7 o'clock. Come into the main entrance and meet it. Uh, just ask the people at the desk where it is. You're all invited. 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Hi, I'm Brooke Ishmael Boatwright. For those of you in the congregation who don't know me, it's great to see you all here. I'm very honored today to introduce to you two wonderful and compassionate people from our Fayetteville community, Hamsa and Moshe Newmark. They had their own family business, Nature's Water, in South Fayetteville for over 20 years, and that's how I met them, and I worked there for over seven years. More importantly, they have been advocates for social justice in our community, in our state, regionally, nationally, and internationally for over 30 years. In 1986, they helped found Bridge of Peace, a nonprofit humanitarian aid organization that began by helping poor rural communities around the world. In late 2013, Hamsa and Moshe, through Bridge of Peace, focused attention on the genocide taking place in Syria and dedicated themselves to help refugee children who have lost everything. Family members, their homes, their childhood, and their future. Many are orphans or martyr children having lost one parent. They live in thin plastic tents with little clothing, food, or heat to keep them warm. Having recently returned from Turkey, they are here with us today to share some of their experiences, some of the projects they have undertaken to help alleviate the suffering they have seen, and to present a brief picture of what is going on in Syria and now affecting the entire world in the light of the recent horrific events in Beirut, Paris, Africa, and elsewhere. They fund their projects from the presentations they give and online through their Facebook page, Bridge of Peace Syria, and from their website. All from ind individuals who generously give to make a positive difference in the world. Please welcome to our church, Hamsa and Moshe Newmark. Brooke, thank you very much, and members of the congregation, thank you for having us here. It's a, a blessing to be able to be here and 
see you and, and share some of our experiences with you. Uh, Brooke, you did such a great job with our introduction. Usually I have to do a little bit of a self-introduction, but you basically have covered all of, a lot of our bases. Uh, so before we get into any specifics, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Hamsa, who has something inspirational she'd like to share with you. Good morning, Brooke. Thank you very much for your wonderful introduction, and thank you, everybody, for coming. I would like to start, and I usually do in my presentation, I'd like to start with a quote. It's a very famous quote by Marianne Williamson, but it was used by Nelson Mandela during his inaugural speech in South Africa. It is called Our Greatest Fear. Our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. I want to say that again. <laughs> you are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Marion Williamson. This is my guiding light. All right. Okay. Just a, a little background <clears throat> about what our work is uh, in Syria right now. Uh, Going to flash back just a, a few years. Uh, in 2011, uh, a great many of the population of Syria stepped forward uh, to ask for freedom, the freedoms that we enjoy, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, the rights of every human and individual in a society. They had been ruled by a dictator for 42 years, his father before him. And uh, this went on for months uh, in the streets everywhere in Syria. And it was met with bullets, it was met with bombs, it was met with detentions, and uh, just horrific brutality. Uh, and that, after eight or nine months, that's when the quote-unquote civil war started. It really wasn't a civil war, it really was a revolution, not too dissimilar from our own revolution in the 1700s. Uh, coming more towards the present, uh, what we see now is, is truly a holocaust of the 21st century. Uh, and I don't use that word lightly. Uh, I come from a Jewish background. I'm very... I have a lot of feelings about the Holocaust of World War II. I was born right at that time. Uh, what I see now is not too dissimilar. There's systematic detentions, systematic torture, systematic starvation, not unlike what the Nazis did in World War II. Uh, what we're looking at right now is over 14 million people displaced. That would be, you could equate it to, in the United States, we have almost 400 million people in our country. That would be over 200 million Americans with no home and scrounging for food, completely displaced. Some of those obviously are making their way to Europe, to other countries, uh, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq. They have taken the most of the refugees, but we still have, we're looking at like 9 million people inside Syria still displaced. And that really is where our work is. A lot of 
attention has been placed on the refugees fleeing to Europe, and it's great. They need all the help they can get. But just imagine what it's like for those people still inside Syria and every day having to face utter brutality. And now with the Russians, uh, with their bombing escapades, uh, we're seeing people fleeing more and more towards the refugee camps that we've been working with. And maybe Hamza can share a little bit about some I of that. I just wanted, I, I think uh, since this is a UNICEF statistic, it is two and a half years old, so it's not even, we couldn't find the latest one. So it's 14 million, nine in Syria, the rest spread out, mainly going to Europe. Out of those 14 million, 220,000, maybe more now in Iraq, 140,200 in Egypt, 619,376 in Jordan, 1,000,000.6.902 million in Turkey, and 1,137,729. Like I said, it's two years old, it has, so we don't have the latest figure. But you can imagine, no, you can't imagine. We cannot imagine. There is no imagination, there is no images of imagination that we can feel or try to even understand what these people are going through. And these people, many of them, like you and me, they had jobs, they had houses, their children went to school, their other children went to university. They are regular people. Some of them had to flee with clothes on their back. Others anticipated, gathered up what they could, and left. Anyway, but the purpose of this talk really is to tell you what we are doing and what two normal citizens, Moshe and myself, uh, have decided to do when we found out and we studied the whole situation what we can do, and we decided we're going to do something, and we're going to get as many people as possible on our side and to help us with um, Bridge of Peace Syria, with clothing, feeding. Right now we're building a huge water system in one of the refu refugee camps. We're sponsoring a whole school, 120 children from the age of four to eight. Over half of them are displaced children that have trauma, but everybody in Syria is traumatized. So, um... Yeah. <clears throat> We've been actively involved. Perhaps, Hamza, maybe why don't you tell them how you got involved and what spurred you on to, to do the action that we're doing? Well, people always ask me, well, how did you get started? Well, how does one get started? You know, I, you know, you all know Facebook, or maybe, maybe some of you are not on Facebook, but this information about what's going on in Syria is all over Facebook. It is all, all over alternative news. So I would see Facebook, and there was this one man, Syrian man, kept posting pictures of children, either hurt or just not clothed properly or cold and this. And, and he would always say, please help, please help, please help. Well, finally, I got in touch with him and said, if you want us to help, you have to tell us how we can help you. And so we were going back and forth. He um, lives on the border in Turkey, near, in Kirkan, which is about, what, 50 miles from the Syrian border. Um, and uh, I said, what can I do? I said, no. I knew a few Europeans that were in the area, and I said, please meet with him, please check him out for me, a woman from Holland and a woman from Australia, who now works for the United Nations, the woman from Kelly, from Australia. So she had a meeting with him, and she gave me the thumbs up. <laughs> he said, he is good. So then I sent him money, my own personal money, it was $500, not that much, but a lot for me. And I said, please show me what you can do with the money. And then he went to Syria, inside Syria, even further than he goes now, and uh, photographed these pictures with him and children and food and chicken and fruit 
and all of this. And um, so I said, okay, I think I can trust this man. That was last year in June. And we have been working together ever since then. We have accomplished a lot. Everything that we have done is on our Facebook page. So when people always say, well, how do you know where the money goes? Well, I know where the money goes. We, for example, last year, before the winter, we um, wanted to purchase a blanket for each child. We had to purchase like 320 blankets. We ourselves priced the prices here in Turkey. And he found a much better price in Syria. So priced 320 blankets with the price that he gave us. We sent the money. He delivered the blankets. We have pictures of the delivery of the truck, of the children, of the women. So now, if you have a family of four children in one tent, four children got four blankets. So we were very, very grateful that we were able to raise the money. Plus, last year in the winter, we bought jackets, boots, coats, hats. The jackets were very difficult scarves and gloves. We delivered tons of potatoes, tons of flour, baby milk, the list is long. And I'm not saying that here to boast, I just want to show you what can be done with just two people. We do almost all the work, but we have a board of directors, we have five board members. And so we discuss things, we check out which projects we can and can't do. And um, maybe Moshe has something else to say. In the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the process of, of uh, doing all this in the refugee camp, we also made contact with another man uh, who was also recommended by somebody. <clears throat> excuse me. Actually, I found him on Facebook too. Right. Um, and um, he lives a little, he actually lives in Syria. He doesn't live in Turkey. And he is the, uh, the director of a school. It's this kindergarten. And an amazing person. Uh, he uh, graduated university. Uh, he works with eight other uh, teachers at the school who are also university graduates. Uh, and said, basically, we started this school with our own resources, uh, but we don't have enough money to keep it open. They have to pay rent. They have to pay transportation uh, to pick up the children, make sure that the children are safe when they get picked up, make sure the children are safe when they return. We have school supplies, all these expenses that you can imagine running a small school. And uh, anyway, uh, Hamza, why don't you fill yeah, in Yeah, it's details. a full curriculum school. It is a school. The teachers don't get paid. We do not have the resource for salaries. We do not pay salaries, we are volunteers. Everybody that works with us is a volunteer. But um, when we were in Turkey, I was thinking about these children that are very traumatized, could really maybe use a little help. The teachers maybe could use some help in um, trauma therapy. And I have many friends in this community and I know an art therapist who has a lot of experience working with traumatized children and violence against children. So um, I connected her on Skype. There was a teacher, there was director, and she talked about um, her expertise is puppets, making puppets and having, would you please, and having like, because they can't really talk. Those children are very isolated, he told me. They sit in the back. So now they, um, the school, the teachers, and the children are making puppets. And they, I've seen the photos how the children allow the puppets to talk to each other and tell each other things. Plus, I told them, please take the coloring books away. Let the children draw what they need to draw, the things that they cannot express. So. I've seen the drawings, and they're not unlike the drawings I've seen when we worked in Central America, El Salvador, Nicaragua, um, very similar. Bombs, people lying in the street bleeding, bombs, airplanes falling down. So at least now the children 
have a little bit of a way to express something that they would otherwise not in a coloring book. You know, you, we all know coloring books and they're fun, but they're, they're, they have a, a, what's it called? An outline. I think. An outline. So there is not much expression. <coughs> and so we are going to have another um, Skype with Joanne Kaminsky and the teachers. We want to introduce collage making as well as a form of art therapy. So um, Abdo told me, he said, now the children really love to come to school. They have a wonderful time making puppets. And then Joanne suggested for those puppets and those little clay figures that they're making, build, let the children build little houses of whatever they have, cardboard or their toys, and then put the puppets or the clay figures to make the children feel, give them a sense that they're projecting themselves into this little figure and make them feel safe. So I've seen those little houses and, and they're actually, it's interesting what is available in Syria in the areas, they're called the liberated areas. Everything comes from Turkey, so they pretty much can get everything. They, they have Play-Doh, <laughs> they have pretty much a lot. And, um, so now there was a big question, okay, if we're introducing art therapy for trauma therapy and build the curriculum around this, we need, we need more time in the school, but we cannot have the children any longer. They come from 8 to 12. That's four hours with no food. There is no food. There is no money for food. So I said, okay, let me see what I can do because this work is so important for the children. So we raise the money. I go personally from friend to friend. This community has been amazing. I, I mean, we have raised thousands and thousands and thousands from this community and the world community, from Ireland, from France, from Indonesia. I'm not talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands, but uh, a good amounts of money. So. For the first month, our, our food program, <laughs> sweet little thing, <laughs> since we're talking about children, right, we have to include the children in whatever we do, so it's okay. Um, yeah, we raised the money for the first month, and it cost a lot to feed 120 children. I was surprised how much money it cost. So on top of the fuel for the winter, the rent, the water, teaching supplies, art supplies, and we added another day onto the school by paying money for gas. Gas just went up in Syria, 100%, from 50 cents to a dollar. Very expensive. And anyway, so, we are raising money for the school, we are raising money for the lunch program, and they're healthy snacks. I insisted on healthy snacks. And the teachers, they all had a meeting and they agreed that it's better to have nuts and raisins and apples, whatever, oranges are available now, they're very inexpensive. And we refrained from cheap cakes and candy because after four hours, the children need to have something more substantial. Plus they're getting each some juice. And I have the most lovely pictures that he sent of lining up 120 plates with these lovely snacks. So uh, right now in the Alvalid refugee camp, which is right on the border of Syria and Turkey, it's part of uh, this huge expanse of refugee camps and tents over 200,000 and more. And within these camps, they're little, they're little camps, and they individually have to take care of themselves. So our camp now, we started with uh, 700 people last year. It's 1,500 people now, and there is no water. So we had to raise a lot of money, and we're in the middle of finishing up it's called the Water for Life Project. As you all know, there's no life without water. Water is a very crucial, and especially clean water, safe drinking water. 
the camp is situated on, uh, in an olive grove, and there was an old well that sits right on an abundant aquifer. But um, the pump broke down and the generator broke down, and so the well has been inactive for two years. So it was a lot of work just to clean out the well. Lots of equipment needed, lots of, and, and Syrians are very, how shall I say, resourceful, intelligent, educated. Immediately they got the crew together, the engineer, what to do, what generator to buy, what cabinet to buy. I mean, boom, boom, boom. I couldn't believe it's just amazing. And uh, we're halfway there. And we're still raising money. We're still $2,000 short on that. So, um, anything else? <laughs> Anyway, uh, before we're finished, and we, we do have just a, a, a little bit more time, and we can perhaps uh, take a few questions, and we'll be in the, in the foyer afterward to visit with you and answer any questions you may have. Uh, we are actively you know, collecting donations, uh, and we can, and I think Brookie will at some point pass a, a plate. Uh, we'll also take donations in the foyer. Uh, we take checks to cash. We even take credit and debit cards, which we can swipe on our phone, thanks to the new technology. Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to mention that it will go right into our Bridge of Peace Syria bank account. We are a 501c3 tax-exempt humanitarian aid organization registered with the state of Arkansas. So any donation you make will be tax-exempt. And um, anyway, that's pretty much what we're doing now. We, ju we recently returned from Turkey, uh, and we got to see firsthand. It's always good to really get a, a physical, visceral sense of what you're doing. You know, we're working from afar. It's sometimes very difficult, a little abstract even. But when we went to Turkey, we actually got to visit with refugees uh, in encampments, make food deliveries, talk to them, and get a real sense. These are real people who are just like us. That's a very important part, which most of forgot. We finally connected with our coordinator that we've been working with for over a year. And to finally meet him was a, a wonderful thing because, you know, everything we did is via Facebook, um, telephone, and Skyping. So that was a most meaningful thing to connect with this man and for him to connect with us. Anyway, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, sometimes when we think of countries like Syria, we're thinking like, oh, these are like third world people, you know, they're all poor people. It's not true. Like Hamza said earlier, these people had lives, they had jobs, they had good jobs. Uh, we met with one man who was actually quite prosperous and uh, he had an amazing business. He was a, a, a stone mason and built facades for businesses, for homes. I mean, I saw some of the photos that he showed us. This guy was just, it's kind of a craft that we don't see anymore. Uh, he had to leave with the shirt on his back. Uh, he's basically maybe a few days out from his next meal with his family. Uh, these people are intelligent, they have educations, and they really, it, it just brought it home that you know, what would happen in a community like ours if, if all of a sudden we all had to make a move like that. And so anyway, I'm just trying to share with you that uh, the reality, it was good to, to get that reality check in our visit uh, to Turkey. And I think we have a little time if anybody has questions. I just want to emphasize that we work inside Syria. We're not tackling the refugee problem in Europe. So just wanted to say that, that is important. They are nine million displaced, so. Okay, any questions? Actually, there's, there are more like nine million inside Syria, and they're scattered around. It's not like they're all in one place, uh, especially when the Russians <clears throat> started bombing. Uh, we saw thousands of people 
more, even more, fleeing from their, their cities to get out of harm's way uh, into fields, wherever they could go. Uh, and a lot of them are coming up around the Turkish border because the closer you get to Turkey, it's a little bit safer. Uh, and like Hamza said, the camp that we are working in, uh, which has 1,500 people as part of a larger camp, can you imagine seeing uh, a span of, of territory with 200,000 people living in tents? tents? I mean, it's All you can see is tents. And we actually, from the road in Turkey, <coughs> we saw this huge camp. It's called Atma Camp. And it's like, and all we could see in the background, on the hills, in the valleys, Tents upon tents upon tents. Here's another project that we are trying to tackle as soon as we can raise more money. These tents have been around for two years, two and a half years. This camp has been in existence. You, the weather is terrible on the border. It's just, uh, it's colder than here. It rains a lot, and when it rains, it pours, and the whole camp turns into mud, and the tents get flooded, but anyway, that's another project. We need to replace some of the tents because they're in disarray. Yes. Yes, we met. So that's what your thought about it, but uh, we, we can have some more, mere, uh, I mean, the Syrians, uh, over the last 200 years, they've accepted the uh, Circassians, the Chechens, and the uh, refugees, the Armenians, after the Iraq. genocides against the Armenians, the Iraqi refugees, the, uh, the Palestinian refugees, and so on. They were in open arms, they were received in Syria, and now the Syrians need the help, and now they are being used as a scapegoat around here in Europe and here in the United States for political grandstanding. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Okay. One of your projects is the well building. I take it, and a second project is working with the school. Where is the school located? The school is located in Haas, Idlib. It's in Idlib province. I mean, it's all close to the Turkish border. And one of the reasons, I think, why these camps are not being bombed is because they're too close to Turkey, and they might have, to, in order to do that, they will get too close to Turkish airspace. And so, um, I think that's one of the reasons why they're not being bombed. So far, the focus of the bombing has not been refugee camps, although near Latakia, they were, uh, uh, the Russian attacked a refugee camp. Um, the Russians are mainly targeting um, crowded areas, markets, hospitals, schools, that is a fact. It is not propaganda. I see it every day. I'm in touch with people there. I see the pictures. I hear. I see the videos. So, um, am I answering your question? Uh -huh. Yes. Um, my third question is, who is actually coordinating the funds that are donated through the Bridge of Peace Syria? It's, there, it's a very, person, yes. Or several people? It's a, what? Is it one person or several people? 
Say that again. Is it one person who's oh. coordinating the funds, or are there several? OK, people? let me just t tell you how we do it. It's very simple. Um, we raise the money here. And then we send it via our Bitch of Peace checking account to Turkey via West Western Union. Our coordinator picks up the money and sends it from Western Union to Syria. These are the, I've been told these are like exchange places that they're a little bit like Western Union, but they're not. There is Western Union in the Assad regime, uh, Syria. I've sent money there also once. That's regular Western Union. But to send to the liberated areas, there is the other exchanges. And then the money gets picked up. And by the time the money gets picked up, he already knows what he needs to buy. He already has the prices. He already knows where to go. We're very coordinated that way. And he's very, very skillful. Does that answer your question? There is no 1%. Nobody makes any money. It goes directly from our bank account to Syria <coughs> via Turkey. Can you all use supplies, or is it cheaper to send, give money and then buy supplies in Turkey or Syria? Uh, it really is not practical to send items from here because the shipping is just so expensive. You could spend thousands of dollars, even more money than the items themselves. So two things. Number one, it's easier and much less expensive to send the money instead of an item. And number two, uh, when uh, we buy, when our coordinator buys the things that are necessary inside Syria, it also stimulates the Syrian economy, the liberated areas. So it's a winning, winning situation to do that rather than give it to a shipping company. <clears throat> so this is more of a question around the, the, the refugees themselves and, and like the man that you mentioned earlier that has a, a job just like us and, and they have th their kids are in school and in university. Um, do they have, you know, what happens to their savings? Do they have money in an account somewhere in their bank? Does that just go away or they can't access that? What happens? It's all gone. They just have to leave everything. I, I, you know, I didn't specifically ask that question, so I don't want to say for sure. But I know for sure when the bomb attacks happen and there's no warning, some just run for their lives with their shirts on their back. I think others anticipate and prepare to evacuate. And there, I think, they can take money out of the bank. They can actually drive their car to the border if Turkey takes them, either Turkey, Lebanon, or Jordan, or Iraq. These are the borders. Um, does that answer your question? I would add, I read something this week in the New York Times about the fact that one of the ways that uh, Daesh or uh, ISIS funds itself is by raiding the banks of places that they've taken control of. So uh, in many instances, the funds that are funding the war are people's savings that are in the banks that have been taken over, that kind of thing. Well, the Assad regime did the same. Yeah. They just took people's assets, bombed the place or before take, whatever, and I have proof of that from many. Anyway, the situation is so much beyond that we can't even comprehend. There is no way we can comprehend, or no way we can even, well, whatever. So my focus is to help the victims as much as possible with what is available to us. And I appeal to all of you to let your heart speak and help us. And I just made a post yesterday because everybody that has helped us from this town, you all are becoming bridges of peace. Thank you. Is that a good stopping point? And you yes. said uh, we can have more conversation in the <clears throat> Is that right? OK. Let's give them a round of applause.
Thank you very much.